Mayan Yisrael of Brooklyn, and the yeshiva.net. Rabbi Vigler, Bruchim Haboyim, welcome everybody. So how does a person in one hour cover the story of a human being on whose matzeva in Tveria the following words have been enshrined, Mimoisha, the Admoisha, Loikom, Kemoisha, meaning from Moshe, from the first Moshe, till Moshe, Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon and the Rambam, like come to Moshe, there arose nobody like Moshe, spanning the generations from Moshe Rabbeinu to Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon in the 12th century. But what we can hope for is to whet our appetite with at least a few points about the life, the accomplishments, the personality, the work, the writings, the volumes of the Rambam and its impact to motivate us to get to know the Rambam a little better through his writings, through his svarim, through his letters, through his life story, through his truvas, through his halachas. It's almost unheard of in the times of yore in ancient history, that a birthday should be recorded, never mind not only a birthday, but the hour of birth. Even yard sites, that yard sites should be recorded is a rarity, but a birthday, today, today we know birthdays, but in the days of the Rambam, before that and even afterwards, we don't know anybody's birthday. We know that Paro had a birthday and a lot of interesting things happened. He had a birthday party. <laughs> we also don't know which date it is. Actually, the Gemara says Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, sorry. Rosh Hashanah is the birthday. Rosh Hashanah is the day that Yosef came out of prison. But Yosef came out of prison as a result of Paro's birthday a few years earlier when the Saramashkim was brought back to his post. The Rambam is an exception. His birthday has been recorded... Erev Pesach of the year Tov Tov Tzadik He Dalid Alofim Tov Tov Tzadik He which would be 4,895 since creation 4,895 since creation or in the English calendar 1135 1135 Erev Pesach approximately 1.20 p.m. Perhaps, just perhaps, this incidental detail about the Rambam is extremely reflective of the Rambam's work. That for him, every detail was significant and particulars were as important as general themes because of him being a holistic person where Klal and Prat, general ideas but also specific details, merge together to give one a full picture of whatever subject he was dealing with. The Rambam was born in Svard, in Spain, the ultimate Svardi, as he often defines himself, Ani Moshe ben Maimon Hasvardi, in the city of Cordova, in Spain. But when he was a young boy of 13, Bar Mitzvah Bacher, he was born 1135, approximately the year 1147. He and his family, his father, Rabbi Maimon, who was a great Dayan, a judge, a leader, a scholar in Cordova, were forced to escape Spain. 
and the story is important to know, to appreciate many aspects of the Rambam's life, the Rambam's pain, the Rambam's sensitivity, which he often refers to. A few decades late, earlier, a new group rose up among the Muslims. Countries, Europe and Africa, was divided between the Christians and the Muslims. Islam was founded in the 600s, in the 7th century, by Muhammad. And a few decades before this story, before the Rambam's birth, a new group, a new movement within Islam developed. And this is extremely important, because if you want to know what's happening in Islam today, you have to know what happened in Islam in the times of the Rambam. The division you often read about between the Shiites and the Sunnis originates in the time of the Rambam. Namely, a new group emerged in Africa, Fez, the area of Morocco, and the group came to be defined as Al-Mahads. Al-Mahads is a combination of two words. Elakim, Echad. Al-Mahad. Al-Mahad in Arabic, one God. The notion of this group was founded by a great Islamic passionate scholar who felt that contemporary Islam of the 12th century became corrupt. Its leaders, its chiefs, its teachers, its sultans are entrenched in materialism. Muslim leaders then, as often today, would, leave a very, would lead a very luxurious life in terms of food, prosperity, furniture, women, style of living. And he said, this is not, this is not religion. Another issue he had was Islam was very developed, relatively speaking, in comparison to Christianity. Islam produced great scholars, great philosophers, great poets, great astronomers, great physicians, and a great culture. Architecture, art, the Rambam was, a, was an extraordinary student of all of these scholars, and many of them came to almost worship the scholarship of the Rambam. They were enthralled by the Rambam. About that a little bit later. But this... this this scholar decided that men, Islam then believed, like many believed, that God has similarities with physical realities. They attributed physical dimensions to Hashem. And Derech Agav, you know, even when the Rambam in Hilchus Truva, when he describes the definition of a min, a heretic, somebody who attributes physical properties to Hashem and derived Rabbeinu Avram ben David, in his Asag, it says, Great Jews attributed physical properties to God. This Muslim scholar said that this is corrupt. And therefore he explained God in much more abstract terms, in terms of oneness and spiritual abstractions. Hence the name Al-Mahad, detachment from materialism. But this man also had a vision. Muhammad came to him in his so-called vision, and told him that Bamed Amurim, that the Quran says that you can tolerate Jews and other religions as dejected people, as second-class citizens. That's for the first 500 years of Islam. But now, after 500 years of Islam, now there's a choice. Either conversion to Islam or death. And of course... As in every vision of prophets, quote-unquote, the 500 years ended right now in my days. He became a zealous freak. The Shiites versus the Sunnis, which, we st which is today one of the most important distinctions in the Islamic world, begins with him. This group developed into the Shiites, which rejected the Sunnis who accepted what you would call the Torah Baal Peh, the oral tradition of Islam which modified some of the strict laws, the Shiites under his leadership, the Almohads rejected it all. And therefore the levels of spiritual worship were very intense, 
but equal to zealousness and fundamentalism and extremism that ultimately produced barbaric cruelty for infidels who weren't ready to accept the philosophy of the Almohads. And thus they went from community to community and gave Jews and other religions the choice. Either they convert or they die. Some places they allowed them to leave as well. They could be expelled, leaving everything behind. This was a major crisis, a major story that unfolds in the days of the Rambam, that he would be forced to address time and time again throughout his life, and which we'll come to learn a lot about the person, his views and his perspectives. When the Rambam is 13, the Almohads arrive in Cordova. So, Bikesh, Moshe, Leishe, Bishalva, but Kafat, of Rugzai, of the Almohads, as so many other Jews, and the family was forced to flee Spain, and for 11 years, they're on the road. For 11 years, the formative years of his life, they're on the road, according to some in a cave, according to some visiting cities and countries, but without a place to rest. Only 11 years later does the family finally arrive from all places in Fez, in Morocco, in North Africa. And that's where the Ramah would remain for a few years, for around five years. They would be forced to flee again from the Almohads. And they would go to Egypt, to Eretz Yisrael. The Ramah would remain for a little while in Eretz Yisrael and then ultimately settle in Egypt for the remainder of his life. He would live in Egypt for more than four decades and that's where most of his work would be created and that's where he would, he would pass away. At the age of 23... Still on the run from Cordova, without a new city, the Rambam began his monumental work that we call Pirush HaMishnayis La Rambam, a commentary on the whole Shisha Sidri Mishnah, written in Arabic, like all of the works of the Rambam besides one. All of the works of the Rambam were written in Arabic. Later in his life, he would write a letter that he regrets he did not write them in Lashon Kodesh, and part of his project, in the future is he's going to rewrite all of his works in Lashon Kodesh. Unfortunately, did not live long enough for that, so all of his words are Arabic and we only have translations of them. And of course, the translations are great, but no translation is great, not because the translators are not great, it's because a translation, by definition, is never accurate. I mean, those of you who read Chumash in the original and Chumash in English, you know, there's just no way the translator can capture even the full content, never mind that which is Bainashur, is between the lines. The Pirush HaMishnayis of the Rambam, which took him around 10 years to write. He started at age 23 on the run. He called it Sefer Hamar, the book that, that casts a light, the source of light, to illuminate the Mishnayis, the whole Shisha Sidri Mishnah. The Rambam's Pirush HaMishnayis, he called Sefer Hamar, and he also, during those years, authored other works. The Rambam wrote a commentary on Gemara, on Talmud Bavli. Like Rashi wrote a commentary, the Rambam wrote a commentary on Seder Moyud, on Seder Noshim, on Seder Nezikin, on Mesech Techulin. We don't have that. The Rambam wrote a summation of all the halachas of Talmud Yerushalmi. Like the Rif did to Talmud Bavli, Rav Alphas did to Talmud Bavli, a summation of the halachas of Talmud Bavli, the Rambam did that to Talmud Yerushalmi, that we also don't have. We do have his commentary to the Mishnah. His commentary to the Mishnah is certainly one of the greatest works of Jewish scholarship. Not only of how it explains the Mishnah, not only it discusses the halach of every Mishnah, not only because of all the scientific explanations in his Pirush HaMishnayis, but it was the first time that somebody articulated in an organized fashion the theology of Yiddishkeit, the hashkafa of Yiddishkeit, not only the practical halacha of Yiddishkeit as it's articulated in Mishnayis. I think it was Rabbi Shamshin Rafal Hirsch, the great rabbi of Frankfurt in Germany, who once said that Christianity was a religion created by man to describe God. And Judaism is a religion created by God to describe man. And Rav Hirsch was speaking from a philosophical, rational point of view. Tanakh, Gemara, 
not the literature of what would later be known as Kabbalah, Pnimi, Satir, and Hasidus, but from the Tanakh and Talmudic point of view, it's a religion of God that is busy describing the human being. If you read Tanakh, you read Nevi'im, you read Ksuvim, at least Pshat, Alafi Pshat, it's describing the human being. The Rambam in his Pirush HaMishnayis and many other works, but it began with Pirush HaMishnayis. So first of all, in his introduction to Pirush HaMishnayis, there's no way you can understand the structure of Judaism without the Rambam's introduction to Pirush HaMishnayis. Till today, and it's really a pity that every yeshiva bacher doesn't learn this, the whole evolution of Pirush Habal Peh. Where did it come from? Who invented it? How did it develop? This whole Judaism that we know today in Tafshin Ayin Dalet, how did it emerge what are its premises? What are its foundations? What is its chemistry? The introduction of the Rambam to his commentary of Mishnah. He gives the Yisoidus of how Torah, the Torah Shabbat Peh develops throughout the ages. Who gives the rabbis their authority? What is this authority based on? What did they hear? What did they not hear? How did it all develop? This is a priceless, a priceless gem of understanding simply the basic building blocks of Yiddishkeit, of Torah, of Allah, of our Messiah, of our tradition. This is his introduction to Pirish HaMashnayis. But in his introduction to Pirkei Yavis, that came to be known as Shmoina Prokim Laharambam, the eight chapters of the Rambam, he gives his psychological perspective on life. The soul, the body, attributes, growth, his Musr, his Ashkaf, his introduction to Perik Chelek, to the 11th chapter of Mishnayis Mesechta Sanhedrin, he discusses the basis of ik- Ikrea Yadus, what he articulated, the first one, as the 13 principles of Jewish faith that came to be known as the Ani Mamans, the Yud Gimel Ikarim. What do we believe in as Jews? It was never articulated. This was given over through the chicken soup, through the kugel. It was never articulated. The Rambam articulated what do Jews believe in, what don't they believe in. The theology, the philosophy, the hashkafas oilam, the velt anshaun, besides the commentary to the Mishnah. At the age of 27, the Rambam penned a letter that's published, and uh, you forgive me saying it again, this letter is a must read for every Jew. Even the name of the letter, Igeres Hashmad, which means the letter of Shmad, the letter of conversion to another religion. Or in some places it's called Maimer Kiddush Hashem, Igeres Kiddush Hashem, the letter of sanctification of God's name. He was 27, he was a recent immigrant to Fez, and the story behind this letter, which is not a very long letter, is an extraordinary story. The story behind this letter is the emotional turmoil that wrecked havoc among the Jewish people as a result of the Almohads. Remember the story of the Almohads. Wherever they came, they forced Jews either to die or convert. Now, they had a policy. The main thing was verbal confession. You had to declare God is true and his prophet Muhammad is true. And you were good to go. Unlike the inquisitors later in the Christian religion in Spain who would search and scrutinize the Anusim, the Muranos, and create a whole infrastructure of terror and espionage to find out who's practicing the religion, the Almohads for the most part didn't care what you did in your bedroom and in your kitchen in the privacy of your home. What perturbed them more than anything was the public display of Jewish religion and a verbal confession and you visiting from time to time the mosques. Naturally, most Jews did that. Many died, were murdered on Kiddush Hashem. Some, many fled, like the Rambam's family. But many gave this verbal, uh, not confession, but acknowledgement of the authenticity of Muhammad, and their lives were speared. Naturally, they couldn't go to shul. There was no public uh, practice of Judaism. But privately, they continued to learn, they continued to daven, they continued to do mitzvahs, many of them. 
one of these Jews, let's call them one of these Anusim, penned a letter to a rabbi. A rabbi who didn't live in one of these places, so he didn't experience it. And he asked him what his opinion about this phenomenon is. And this man wrote back a letter, which we know from the Rambam's letter, in which he wrote that these Jews are what you would call today the scum of the earth, the worst of the worst. They're they're idol worshippers, they're loathed by God and by Torah and by Jewish history. Let them not think that any prayer or any mitzvah they do is worth anything. It's meaningless, it's insignificant, it's an abomination. There's only one alternative. The alternative is to die al Kiddush Hashem. If you could run away, run away. And all these Jews have no part in the Jewish people, have no part in God. This letter came back to the community of the Anusim, who were sensitive Jews, who in many ways were fine Jews, and it tore them to pieces. It devastated them to their core. The Rambam at the age of 27 penned his first and probably most famous letter, he's a Geras Hashmat. It's in this letter, I once read somebody wrote, if all we had from the Rambam was his Geras Hashmat, Dayenu. Dayenu. And I understand why he wrote this. The Rambam, we have much more. But if you only have the Geras Hashmat, Dayenu. What do you see in the Geras Hashmat? I'll tell you what you see, at least the way I see it, is this. Um... You know, generally there are two types of people. There are brains and there are hearts. I mean, there are also arms and legs. But generally, you have great brains and you have great hearts. What I mean by this is there are people who are real academic geniuses, not the ordinary person. And they're usually not social. They're not social. They have no time no patience, no energy for people, because most people are not in that league. They love books. They love scholarship. They're geniuses. They are brains. Even their legs are brains. In the Jewish world, many of them become go'inei o'ilam. You know, Bavli and Yerushalmi and Tosefta and Rishonim and Acherinim and Shulchan Aruch and Tur, etc. They're geniuses. But their hearts don't match their brains. They may be fine, they may be nice, they may be sensitive, especially if they learn halacha, they know that there are dinim. There are dinim of how to behave, they know them lechaveir, and they may practice all that, and may be very ethical and moral. But to say that you see in them burning love and passion, it's not, it's not part of, it's not who they are. And you have other people who are great hearts. They're emotional people. They're sensitive, they experience agony. They know what empathy is. They know how to look into somebody's eyes and really be there for them. But that takes a toll on the brain. They have big hearts, gigantic hearts. There's a tremendous warmth. And I'm not talking about now people who have a balance of both. I'm talking about extraordinary in one area, extraordinary in one another area. It's rare that you will find in history a human being who truly and absolutely synthesizes both of these qualities in an extraordinary fashion where the brain is unparalleled in its endless curiosity for knowledge and its mastery of knowledge to a point that is mind-staggering literally and yet there is a burning Avas Yisrael somebody who really cares ad imke hanefesh to the depth of the soul for a Jew who may be living thousands and thousands of miles away that doesn't affect them in any way. In the Rambam you see this. In the Rambam you see it in the most vivid way. And you see it very much in this letter in Eger Hashmat. The Rambam was a great intellectual, and he'd not say. And he usually writes that way. There's a certain menucha uh, sanefesh, there's a serenity, there's a hisyashvus, uh, a calmness that characterizes the Rambam's writings. But in Egeris Hashmad, here he stands like a lawyer in court defending his people. It's a letter, just learning this letter is Kedai, but I want to 
quote one piece because I think that this always has to be told. He speaks about this rabbi. He says, I want to tell this rabbi something. Generally, people should have compassion on their, they should be, uh, they should be calculated with their words much more than they're calculated with their money. I wish he was calculated with his words more than he's calculated with his money. And he says, before you speak, before you give a drasha, make sure you prepare it once, twice, three times, four times, then review it, then give it over. But if you're going to write something, then you have to think about it a thousand times before you transcribe it. Uh, one thousand times. We were speaking Mela. That's for the Rabbin. But writing, this you need a thousand times. This person didn't do any of this. And then he begins to review this man's letter point by point by point refuting it and he addresses the lives of four people Moshe Elio Anavi Yeshaya and the Malach Moshe Tells Hashem this week's parsha, "Vehein lo yaminuli, Jews won't believe me. They don't believe me that the redemption is coming, that the gula is coming." And Hashem tells him, "Hey, ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim, a Gemara and Shabbos daf tzadik zayin. They're ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim. You're the one who won't believe one day." In Parshas Chukas, the story of Meimir Riva, Elio Anavi comes to Hashem and tells him, "Emelachim." I'm zealous for God because the Jews abandoned your covenant. So Hashem tells him, Before you speak negatively about the Jewish people, Shouldn't have you first found the negativity what's going on by the nations of the world? Yeshaya Hanavi tells Hashem in his Nevuah, Eicha hoisa lezoyna, Kirya nemona, Jerusalem became a zoyna, Tzedek yolinbav ata meratzchim, there used to be justice and now it's full of murderers, Betoich tmei, Betoich am, Tmei sfasayim, Anoichi yoshev, he says later, I'm dwelling among a nation with contaminated lips, and the Malach comes over to him, and burns his lips for speaking so about the Jewish people, the Rambam says, quotes the Gemara, he wasn't atoned till his own grandson, Menashe killed him. And then when the Malach says about Yehoshua ben Yehoi Tzadok, that his, the Kohen God in the beginning of Bayesheni, that his sons intermarried, they married non-Jews, Hashem says, Yigar Hashem b'cha satan, He's a strand rescued from the fire. How dare you speak like this about the Kohen Gadol whose sons intermarried. Zok the Rambam. I have to quote this. Im kach nenshu amude oilam. Moshe liyo yeshaya umalache shores kishanosu badas yisro ma'advar. If the pillars of the world were so punished, Moshe liyo anava yeshaya and angels when they spoke a little bit, a little negativity against the Jewish people. Kol shekein. Kal mi kalei oilam. Yatir l'shoyne al kehilis Yisrael. Chachomim talmideim koyenim levim v'koyne yoysam. Poishim rishoyim goyim psulei edis. V'koyfrim b'ashem alakei Yisrael. Ma yiye onshoy. A light-headed man gets up and speaks like this about the Jewish people. They're goyim. They're koifrim, they're psuleyeders, they're poishim, they're rishoyim. I don't know what is punishment. They didn't rebel against God because they were looking for luxury and for a life of prosperity. They didn't abandon religion because of the pleasures of the time. 
God never abandons them. When Yitzchak smells the smell of Yaakov's clothes, the Medrash says, it doesn't say Bgodov, read it, Bgodov. His, his rebels, his traitors, these are the Jews. Kol Mashama Abadam Alibay, this rabbi invented everything. And the Rambam here lets loose, if I could express himself. And he describes, first of all, his shitta that Islam is not Avedi Zara. And they're not obligated to die. Sure, it's praiseworthy if somebody can leave. It's great and unbelievable if somebody's Makadish Hashem. But to say that they're not Jews and they're horrible Jews, he says halachically they're justified in doing it. And every mitzvah they do is unbelievable. And then later he goes on to describe, he says, Nebuchadnezzar the Russia took three steps, the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Nebuchadnezzar took three steps in honor of Hashem. And because of that he received the Malucha for three generations. And these Jews for their mitzvahs don't get anything. This is the Igeres Hashmad of the Rambam, that he wrote at the age of 27, which means in 1160, 1160, approximately 1162, when he's in Fez. I mentioned from Fez, they ultimately escaped to Egypt, Eretz Yisrael, but the Rambam was not long in Eretz Yisrael. He settled in Egypt for the remainder of his life, and there are letters the Rambam used to sign Moshe ben Maimon, Ha'oiver al Shloisha Lavin Bechal Yom. Moshe ben Maimon, the man who violates three transgressions every day, because it says three times in the Torah. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to Egypt. Imagine a rabbi today signing letters like that. Ha'oiver al Shloisha Lavin Bechal Yom. Now, of course. Why did he stay there? I'm not sure the Rambam was over al Shloy Shalav and Bechol Yoim. The Rishonim and Acharonim talk a lot about this. The Rambam probably was not over al Shloy Shalav and Bechol Yoim, but he was probably saying, I'm sensitive to the fact that I'm living in Egypt. I'm not taking it for granted. You know, he was conscientious. He was alert. Every letter he wrote, there's a, you have to justify being in Egypt. You have to justify being in Egypt. Just like according to Shittas Haramban, that Yeshua to Yisrael is a mitzvah, you have to justify living in New York, <laughs> living in the United States of America. It may be the right thing, it may be the wrong thing, that's a separate discussion. But you have to justify it. You have to ask yourself, at least according to Shittas Haramban, if not according to Shittas Harambam. I'm telling that it's a mitzvah's essay in our Torah, Yeshua The Rambam's life in Egypt, once he arrived in Egypt, was unbelievably successful, but on another level it was unbelievably tragic. The Rambam settles in Egypt, first in Alexandria, and then in Fustat, which is the ancient city of Cairo, Fustat, and remains there for the rest of his life till his passing. When he comes to Egypt, his father, Rabbi Maimon, passes away and his kinship to his father was simply extraordinary. It devastated him terribly. But another tragedy struck the Rambam. He can afford to be entrenched in the world of Torah and Chachma because of his partnership with his brother. His brother, Rabbi David, was a merchant of diamonds and pearls. And they had a partnership. The Rambam, I guess, was an investor. But whatever the partnership was, and Reb David supported, the Rambam supported the family. And on one trip to India for business, Reb David drowned. And not only did his wealth drown with him, but also a lot of what he had in debt went down with him. The Rambam writes in a letter that as a result, he was depressed for a year. And he became physically ill from pain, he describes his love to his brother, his comfort that he had from his brother. He was unbelievably close to his brother. And his brother's death, and his brother left a widow, and his brother left a little girl, and now he had to raise them. The Rambam's wife passed away, and according to the Rosh in Brachas, Rabbi Noasher, two of the Rambam's children 
two, both of his children passed away in Egypt. I should mention there is a girsa that the Rosh meant Ramban, not the Rambam, although many say, there, as it's printed, the Rambam. The Rambam did remarry. He married a second wife in Egypt, and he had two sons. One is the famous Rabbeinu Avraham ben Arambam, and another one, David, who he named after his deceased brother. But for the Rambam, this agony was very, very deep. And the Rambam was an extremely emotional and sensitive person. Sometimes you read some of his works, you don't realize it. But when you read all of his works, you realize the depth of the Rambam's emotion. The Rambam's shita generally was one of holistic Judaism. Maybe he's a holistic human being, which means shlemos, organic. Everything was included. Judaism included the mind and the heart, the body and the soul, the brain. <laughs> For the Rambam, Avodah Hashem was encompassing of the entire universe, of the entire spectrum of scholarship, of emotions, of behavior. The Rambam didn't believe in fragmentation. The Rambam was the ultimate Isha Ashkoilas that encompassed every angle of human achievement and accomplishment and incorporated it in his Ashkafas Oilam of what Yiddishkeit is. Now, in Egypt, after his brother died, the Rambam, who was an unbelievable expert in medicine, became an official physician. And this opened a whole new chapter in his life because the leader of Egypt at the time was one of the most famous Islamic emperors in history, known as Saladin, that even today... Even today, some of the Arab leaders crave that they will be the Saladin of the present, of the contemporary Arab world, because Saladin conquered and conquered and conquered and conquered. And he appointed the Rambam as his personal physician. And when he died and his malucha was challenged, there was, there was a contest, contention among his 17 children. His son who took over there in, in Cairo, the Rambam continued to be his physician. And in a letter, the Rambam writes... How each morning, Bahashkama, at dawn, before dawn, he has to get onto his wagon, onto his horse or his animal, and go every single day to Saladin to check on his health. There's no exception. He said, if everything is good in the palace, he gets home after midday. If not, if there's a problem, then he could be there all day. And if anybody else is sick in the family, in the palace, he has to be with them. He says, I come home. The Rambam writes about his schedule. I come home. One of his, his translators, Ibn Tavan, wanted to come see him. So he writes a letter, I want to come see you. He says, you want to come see me, but let me tell you my schedule. I come home after midday, and my home is packed with people, Jews and non-Jews, simple people, laymen, scholars, policemen, military people, people who love me, people who hate me, Any, everybody needs my help. Whether it's in medicine or advice or counsel, he says, I come home starving, mace off, dead hungry, I apologize to everybody for making them wait. I go in to grab something to eat. And then all day I'm there with them till late midnight. The only time I could speak to the Jews and I can read something is on Shabbos. He says, Shabbos, right after davening, I guess they daven right at dawn, till midday they sit and learn with me and we discuss the community and then some come back also after mincha till the night. He says, the only time I get to read something. The Rambam was appointed by Saladin as the Nugget, as the leader over the Jew, the Kehillis in Egypt. And soon came to be known as literally the Poisik Hadar, the greatest halachic and spiritual authority of his generation, at least by many, many Jews. So his time was extremely, extremely limited to the point he says he doesn't have an extra minute. In, I want to mention another letter. The Rambam wrote another letter called Igeris Taimon, the letter of Yemen. He received a letter from the Jews in Yemen, three things. First of all, they were terribly devastated because of the Almohads, because of the Shmad. Second, there was a man in Yemen who decided he's Mashiach. He walked around day and night saying he's Mashiach. And third, there was another Jew who kept on proving that Judaism and Teresh Balpeh is false. Igeris Taman is a long and unbelievable gem of the Rambam's literature. This he already writes in Egypt in 1172. 
There he explains where anti-Semitism comes from. The core and the reasons of the hatred to the Jewish people. What the Torah is. There he explains the evolution of Torah. He refutes the person who has all of his questions on Torah. And then he discusses how to handle with the guy who is Mashiach, who he describes he needs a lot of help. Mentally, we had a lot of mental challenges. The Rambam gives eights is there. Igeris Taimon, you see once again his nature of leadership. The Rambam as a manik, the Rambam as an oy of Yisrael, the Rambam as a practical person. In the year 1170, at the age of 35, the Rambam began writing his, what we call his magnum opus, his most monumental work, known today as Yad HaChazaka, or in his name is Mishnah Torah. But before he wrote it, he wrote an introductory work, I don't know if you know, called Sefer HaMitzvahs. Sefer HaMitzvahs is a small work. It's an encyclopedia of all the 613 mitzvahs with a brief description of every mitzvah. It's a lovely introduction if you want to get to know every single mitzvah briefly. One or two or three paragraphs. That Sefer HaMitzvah that he wrote the first year at the age of 35, 1270, 1170, in Egypt. Following that, he begins developing each mitzvah, the Mishnah Torah. Now the Mishnah Torah deserves... Many years, but at least a few moments of explaining something the Rambam did. Today, living almost a millennium later, we take it for granted. But we should not take for granted what the Rambam achieved with Mishnah Torah. There was absolutely no seder to Judaism. I mentioned before the issue of theology, philosophy, but forget that. In Halacha, there's no seder. If you learn Gemara, you know that in one Masechta of Gemara, you have sugya after sugya after sugya. You have thousands of different subjects, stories, ideas, conversations, arguments, disputes, Shaklavatayas, Pulpulam, Agada, Agada history combined together in a Masechta of Gemara. Usually no halacha. Never mind, you have Bavli, you have Yerushalmi, you have Mishnayis, you have Toisefta, you have Brises, you have Sifri, you have Sifra, you have Teres Koyedim, you have all the Midrashim. Where do you begin? Where do you begin? So the Rif, Rabbeinu Yitzhak Alphas, who was from Fez, Alphas, Fez, Fez, Fez Samach. Why he's called Elphas is two reasons. Either because he was from Fez, where the Rambam also lived. By the way, in Fez, they have a house they call the House of the Rambam. And, uh, and also, Ilfus is a pot. Is a pot. The Rabbeinu Yitzchak Alphus, the Rif, began from Talmud Bavli. He made a concise version of Talmud Bavli, only halacha. But even after that, besides Talmud Bavli, you have much more. And even that, it didn't include all the details. It was only quotes from the Gemara, halacha lemaisa. Imagine walking in to such a situation... What do you do with it? And the Rambam was the first one in Jewish history to take the whole body of halacha, of Jewish life, of Jewish behavior, and he asked himself the question, how do I give it order, how do I give it structure? And he did it. How did he do it? The first thing is, he divided halacha into 14 general categories, and those became the 14 Names of his 14 svarim, that's hence the name Yad HaChazaka. doesn't only mean a strong arm, it means Yud Dalet, because of his 14 svarim. And listen to the names. Listen to the names. Because he had to come up and divide Yiddishkeit into these 14 categories. Without anybody doing it before him. Knowledge. Love. Women, relationships, no. Knowledge, love, times, times, life cycles, women, relationships, okay. holiness, holiness, uh, segregation or pledges, agriculture, service, sacrifices, purity, Civil damages, acquisitions, justice, and judges. 
Leadership. Leadership. Mada, Ahava, Zmanim, Noshim, Kedusha, Hafla, Zroyim, Avoida, Karbonois, Tahara, Nizikin, Kinyan, Mishpatim, Shaiftim. I once made a little joke. I was giving a lecture on Shalom Bayes. Mar- marriage issues. So I said, all you want to know about Shalom Bayes, you just have to know from the Rambam structure. Because when the Rambam was wondering, where do I put in all the halachas of marriage? Where does that fit into Judaism? Which category of the books? So, in this humorous imagination, he went to consult different communities. I'm not going to say all of them by name, but he went to consult different communities. Okay? So he went to the Ger Hasidim, and he said, where does marriage belong? He said, Kedusha. Belongs in Kedusha. He went to the Brisker. They said, Kenyan. It's a din, it's a Kenyan, it's a Chalois Kenyan, right? If you learn Kedushan with the Brisker Torahs, you know what I'm talking about. He went to another group, I'm not going to say the name, and they said Nezikin. <laughs> he went to another group, I don't have to say the name, and they said it's all about Ava. It's Ava, that's what it is. Another group said, also without a name, Zrayim, Sindered. And then they went, I think probably it was Los Angeles, Hollywood, and they said, you know, you're going to end up in a few months by the lawyers, it's Mishpatim. It all ends up in court anyway. You know, it's in a question of estates and so forth. And then he went to another group, and that group said, it's for sure Carbonus. You know, she's your carbon. And then they went to a therapist, and the therapist says, it's an avoida, it's an avoida, you got to work on your marriage, you know. It's all about avoida. And then another group screamed that it's Tara. It's all about Tara. Somebody else said it's manim, this times as they, times as they, don't take it too seriously. Etc., etc. Came the Rambam and he made a safer called Noshim. <laughs> she's not a Kenyan, and she's not an Azikin, and she's not Yukarbin, and she's not Yukdusha, and she's not Yutada, and she's not Yisrayim. There's something called Noshim. Your wife has an independent personality, she's a human being. That was a Maimer HaMuzgar. To take all of Yiddishkeit and divide it into these 14 categories, and now within each one, he put in the halachas of that realm. So for example, the book of Mada, what do you put there? So he put there, Hilchis Yisoyde HaTorah, the foundations of Torah, which include the bases of Amuna. He put there, Hilchis Talmud Torah, Hilchis Avoidezara, Hilchis Tshuva, Hilchis Deus, the halachis of Midos. This is Mada, the knowledge, the basis of wisdom. What's your view on life? Ava are all the mitzvahs that deal with our love, love between the human being and God, an emotional relationship with Hashem. Hilchis Tfila, Hilchis Kriyashma, Hilchis Brachis, Tzitzis, Tfilin, Zmanim, life cycles, of course. Shabbos, Erevin, Yom Tev, Chametzamatza, Megillah Chanukah. Shoifer Sukalulav, Yem Kippish, Vesis Aser, Noshim, all the laws of marriage, divorce, Yibum Chalitza, etc. And so he went on and on. Kedusha, all the laws that create Kedusha in Jewish life. So you have, for example, Hilchas Machalas Asuris, Isurei Bia, in relationships, in food, Hafla, like the pledges, Nedorim, and so on and so forth, Zrayim, all the laws of agriculture, Trumas, Meisters, Kilayim, Shmita, Vyoyvel, etc. Avoid the Karbonis, Beis Hamikdash, Tara, Toman, Tara, Nizik, and all civil relationships, Kenyan, laws of sales, laws of partnership, Mishpatim, is all the laws of Mishpatim, and then Shoift, which includes all the laws of kings, leaders, the laws of, of even the laws of Mashiach. What's unique in the Mishnah Torah is, there's not one halacha in the world of Yiddishkeit that's not addressed. In Tur, in Shulchan Aruch, you don't have Hilchis of Mashiach. You don't have halachas of the Beis Hamikdash. You have halachas of Zman Azeh. 
But the Rambam wrote a book in which he wrote, I called it Mishnah Torah. Why Mishnah Torah? What does Mishnah Torah mean? The second Torah. Why? You can read Torah Shabbat Sav, then read my Sefer, and I quote his introduction, If you want to know how to live as a Jew day to day, 365 days a year, throughout your whole life, how to hatch them, how to match them, how to dispatch them. You have this, you don't need anything else. You have Torah, you have this. Two minds said both interesting verte that testify to this. They come from different sources. A Yid was once on a Yechidus, a private audience with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he asked Lubavitcher Rebbe Akash, Arov, how do I know? He wrote it in his Sefer. What he heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he wrote it in his Sefer. What was the Shaila? The Rambam in Zmanim has a section called Hilchis Megillah Vechanaka. How does he start Hilchis Megillah? He starts with the laws of reading the Megillah. Right away. You got to read the Megillah at night, you got to read the Megillah by day, the Brachas. How does he start Hilchis Chanaka? You would expect the laws of Chanukah, how to light Chanukah candles. Now, Hilchis Chanukah begins, Be made by his Shani. Malche Yavon came and oppressed the Jewish people. Poshto Yodem, Bimam Moinam, Bibne Seyam Lachat, Sum Lachat Zgodl. The Greeks began making Tsaris, the Chashmanoyim revolted, there was a whole war. And when they were victorious, they triumphed. And the story of the oil burning. And then, after two full halachas, where the Rambam tells the history, he says, hiskinu. And because of that, the sages of that generation instituted eight days of Hanukkah, and he begins the halachas. So he asked the Rebbe, I don't understand, why doesn't he begin Hilchas Megillah? You know, Bimei Golos Paras, a guy, Homan, came around and did what he did, and they were victorious, and umipnezeh, agut akasha. So the Rebbe said, it's Pashat. Read the Rambam's introduction. The Rambam says, my Sefer is Mishnah Torah. You read Torah Shabbat Sav, and then you want to know what's Torah Shabbat Peh. I articulate to you every halacha about Jewish life, past, present, future men, women, children, leaders, Koyanim, Levim, Beis Hamikdash, Golos, Mashiach, Basman Azeh, past, future. Every halacha of Jewish life. So the Rambam is assuming you finish reading Tanakh. If you read Tanakh, you read Megillah Sester. You know the history of Purim. So you get straight to Halacha. But even if you read Tanakh, you don't know the story of Hanukkah. He doesn't assume you learned Shabbos, Perik, Bamem, Madlik, and Dav Chafalaf. Taner Rabban and my Hanukkah. That's not what he says. He's loyal to his mission statement. I finished Tanakh. Hilchis Hanukkah. Why am I lighting candles? Can anybody tell me? I'll tell you why. Something happened. And then I saw a few years ago, Yeshiva Shabbat Yitzhak al and gave out a kovitz and they printed some old tzavim from Rabbi Yosheb Bar Soloveitchik. He asked the same question, he answered the same answer. Now here is the irony of history or the irony of God. The Rambam says, you don't need any other sefer besides this book. You have the Bible, what we call Torah Shabbat Sav, you have Mishnah Torah, you're done. Health day, Bishter, God helps. There's no Sefer that has so much commentary on it as the Rambam's Mishnah Torah. <laughs> There's not one book in Jewish history that has so much written on it to explain what did he mean, where did he get it, to decipher every word, every sentence, every nuance in the Rambam's Mishnah, like the Rambam's Yad HaChazok and Mishnah Torah. You said they don't need any other Sefer after this. There's probably 10,000. And this is not an exaggeration. And every, day, every week, there's a new Pirish on the Rambam. And some of them, as you know, have changed a lot of the course of Jewish learning. And the Rakachov, it's often Spanech al Rambam. Chidush Rabbi Nechaim Alevi al Rambam. The whole Briska Mahalach came from the Rambam. Through the Rambam. Diuk and the Rambam. The Rambam's Mishnah Torah transformed the landscape of Judaism then because it wasn't just the style of writing. Not only his grammar, not only his Lashon Kodesh, this is the only work he wrote on Lashon Kodesh. Not only his clarity, not only his brevity, but its holistic component, 
the Shleimus. Suddenly a person went in into an endless maze, into a Mayim She'ein Lehem Soif, literally an endless ocean, which is what he describes as the Yam HaTalmud. And he, he created a Seder, there's a system, there's a structure. Every one, every section of Yiddishkeit has a book. Every book has different halachas. Every halacha has different chapters. Every chapter has individual halachas. All together, how many halachas are there in the 14 books of the Ram? Anybody knows? How many halachas are there? If you take, take Hilchas, Sisaydi Atari, Hilchas, individual halachas, 83. Pei Gimel halachas. 83 halachas, all together. And you have the whole Yiddish guy. That includes Hilchis Melech HaMashiach, Hilchis Melech Melech HaMashiach, Hilchis Sanhedrin. It includes everything, 83. It's interesting, in one of his sikhs, the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, the Rambam passed away, Chof Tevis. He was born Erev Pesach. That Erev Pesach, he would have been 70. He died at 69. So he wasn't full, filled. But he says between Chav Tevis, Erev Pesach is 83 days. The 83 halachas of the Rambam, so to speak, symbolically were mashlam. They completed the full cycle of 70 like David HaMelech, Yemei Shnei Seinu Behem Shivim Shana. But the Rambam's Mishnah told it, till today, till today, although we learn Shulchan Aruch and we learn Tur and we learn Rishonim and we learn Acharonim, etc. But the, the, the Mahalach, never mind the Lamdis, is from the Mishnah Torah. That's why the Rebbe made a takon in 19, when was it, 1980, uh, I remember, Tov Shin Mem, hey, 1985, just like this Daf Yoimi of Bavli, Reb Meir Shapiro, this Daf Yoimi of Yerushalmi, Ger, the Ger Rebbe, Schusam Yogan Aleinu, this Halacha Yoimis, this Mishnah Yoimis, so the Lubavitcher made a takon of Rambam Yoimi, in three ways. One is three Praka Mishnah Torah a day, you finish in a year. A year you finish the whole Ramam, the whole Yad Chazak. That's three Praka a day. One Perik a day, one Perik Ramam a day, you finish three years. And he said children or others that even that's difficult, say for HaMitzvah, which is a short book and you also finish in a year. And you learn every day the mitzvahs that parallel the three Praka of Yad Chazak. When you... Huh? The Sefer HaMitzvah is that parallel is what? But this Mishnah Torah, you read it, you start looking at it, and you appreciate when it was written, how it was written, the context in which it's written. One marvels. So he started it at the age of 35. He was 35. It took him 10 years, and he finished at the age of 45. Of course, he had critics. The Rambam had many, many critics. They burnt his farm in France. They burnt his farm twice. The government had his farm burned because of a messiah of Jewish kanoim, zealousness, zealous, zealous Jews. In Yemen, in Kaddish, when he was alive, they said, Yisrael, that was the, the reverence, the awe in which the Rambam was held. But even if you go through the whole yeshiva system, and sometimes you have a shir and a Rambam for three weeks, you often don't get the full picture of the Rambam, nor will you ever know that the Rambam authored approximately 20 books on medicine. Just 20 books on medicine, besides everything else. We have a number of them. Seven were pu published. The rest are either lost or remain in libraries somewhere to be published one day. But the Rambam wrote in the 12th century on medicine, I was reading reviews from contemporary great physicians, and they said the accuracy and the, the level of development of a man writing in the 12th century is unbelievably, and how accurate it is scientifically, useful to this very day. 
The Rambam wrote a book that was a problem in Egypt with snakes biting people. He wrote a book about how dealing with snake bites before the doctor comes, before medicine is applied. The Arabs asked him to write essays on intimacy, which wasn't easy for him. The process, he wrote that. The Rambam wrote in his medicine, he has works in uh, dermatology, pharmacology, anatomy, the whole, an the whole structure of anatomy of the human body. The Rambam wrote a book on Diktuk Milo Sahigoy and books on 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 on, on Chachma Sachesh and Chachma Saibur. One wonders where a person had the mind, had the time, had the resources, had the energy. And besides, he answered letters after letters after letters from all the Kehillas of the Jewish world. Besides his daily leadership of the Jewish communities and being one of the greatest physicians and philosophers. And towards, after the Mishnah Torah, he got into his great book, which was an incredible achievement, known as the Meir Nevuchim. The Guide to the Perplexed. The Meir Nevuchim is an intense sefer. It has three sections, but it's quite an intense sefer. And the Meir Nevuchim, this is the book in which the Rambam addresses himself to all the perplexed and gives a whole philosophical explanation of Judaism using all the contemporary philosophy at the time, which was primarily Greek philosophy from the school of Aristotle, and showing that Judaism embodies the ultimate truth of existence and the ultimate truth of philosophy as the Rambam did it in a, in a most brilliant way, an extraordinary organized way of Mary Nebuchim going through the reasons for all the mitzvahs, explaining what prophecy is, what Torah is, what Judaism is, going through all the different hashkafas of Yiddishkeit. The Mary Nebuchim is a world, a world in and of itself. And of course, it was also no, not, no small controversial uh, safer in many ways because of its nature, because of its quality. I want to read to you, <laughs> I want to read to you something. It's just very interesting. I think it has a lot of contemporary relevance. The Rambam, of course, had a position. Why did he have a position? Like always, some people probably the Shem Shemaim, and some people it's called jealousy. There was a man who was actually a genius. He was a great Rosh Hashiva. His name was Reb Shmuel ben Eli. He had a yeshiva in Baghdad, in Iraq, in Bavel, Babylonia, Iraq. Reb Shmuel ben Eli, his name of the yeshiva was Goin Yaakov, which means the pride of Yaakov, the pride of Jacob. He had a yeshiva. It was very hard for him to deal with the Rambam. And he had a lot of opposition to the Rambam. Although he respected him, he writes a letter to the Rambam in which he refutes his psak din, that you're allowed to travel on Shabbos in boats through the great rivers. In Baghdad, they had a minig against it. He challenges the Rambam, how can you write that? He writes very respectfully how you're praising the whole world. A lot of very, very, but then he attacks him. So the Rambam writes back to him. He says, you know, I read your letter and I thank you for all the praises. But Ich bin Meichel, you're praising me. I wish you would have thought about my words a little more. Instead of praising me, you should have reflected on what I said because it was somewhat of a cover-up of his deep opposition to the Rambam. Now the Rambam had a beloved student who came to study with him in Egypt, and the Rambam saw in him his child, his spiritual child. His name was Rabbeinu Yosef, Rabbeinu Yosef Ibn Eknin, Rav Yosef. He moved to Baghdad, and he was very perturbed by this Rav Shmuel, and he decided he's opening up a new yeshiva in Baghdad, what else is new? And this yeshiva is going to be taught according to the Rambam. They were here, they're going to learn the Svarim of the Rambam. You have to understand that the Rambam's Svarim had an unbelievable impact in his days. His Pirush HaMishnayis, his Yad HaChazok, his Mishnah Torah, his Meir Nevuchim. Some were even translated during his lifetime. So he asked the Rambam, he asked the Rambam, about doing it, about opening up this competitive yeshiva in Baghdad. So the Rambam says to him, My dear child, Don't make this man your balmach like this. Don't get into a fight. Even if there may not be profound wisdom in his attacks on me, there's an issue of age. You're a young man. He's an elderly person. So the Rabbi Yosef asks the Rambam, he says, 
Ona din zeha ish vidasai. This man spews venom against you. Justice has to be done. So the Rambam says this. He had a lot of power in Baghdad. He was had a lot of political power. So he says, I have to quote this. Roiv anshe hadas. Most religious figures who have power. Most religious people, when something happens that affects their power, their entire humility, their entire subservience, their entire edelkeit is gone. Most religious people, the moment it's an issue of power, the year is Shemayim, their fear of heaven is God. They start believing that Midas Toivus, that ethics are not part of religion. That's not part, that's not part of religion. The Rambam says, you're so upset, you expect them not to scream. You expect him not to be upset at you? Don't you know that you ruined his name? If not for you, the whole community, he would be the undisputed leader like a bird that's caught by a daw, by a, an ostrich catches a bird in its prey. He would have had everybody and you came and you made your own mice. Don't demand from somebody whose name and reputation and power you're damaging that he should love you. Don't expect that in life. And the Rambam tells his student, don't make him your bal, don't make him, don't make him your bal because when it comes to these issues of power, you don't realize what happens even to great people even to very, very religious people, a life of Midas Toivis, of Yerushamayim, could somebody, could somebody sometimes fly out the window, and sometimes you wonder if this wasn't written uh, in Tov Shanai and Dalit. In Tov Shanai and Dalit, and probably, probably many, uh, many other times. You probably know that there is a Tfilas Haroife, a prayer of a doctor, that was attributed to the Rambam, who was a great physician, you know the Rambam wrote in this Tfilah Saroife, it's, it's, it's not a short prayer, but there's two lines that one has to remember to see something about the Rambam. He says, before he would start his work, I'm getting ready to start working in my job as a physician. Help me, Hashem. Ten belibi ava leumnasi velibriyay secha. Implant in my heart love to my craft and to your creatures. Don't allow love of money and craving for reputation and glory to intervene into my work because these attributes oppose the love of truth and the love of people. Give me strength. I should be ready to help the wealthy and the poor, the good and the bad, my friends and my enemies. I should always see in every sick person only the human being in him. Give me strength, neged hashoitim, ha mischakimim, ha noisnim bi doifi, shaloi osur miderech ha emes belisho masoponim. Those who are always making fun of me and putting me down, it should not cause me to leave the path of truth without becoming deceptive in any way, without bribing anyway. There was an Arab poet. His name was Al Sayyid Ibn Sina. You don't have to remember that. Al Sayyid Ibn Sina. Okay. He wrote a poem about the Rambam. Now, till the Rambam's day, the greatest physician in human history was a man known as Galinus. 
a brilliant, brilliant physician. He writes, this, 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 Arab, this Arab poet, al Sayyidi Ibn Sini, he says, Galinus yirape irak es haguf, uben maimoin yirape es haguf vahanefesh keechot. Galinus he heals the body. The son of Maimon, Maimonides, he, for him, he heals the body and the soul as one. Al yidei chachmasa yachalu lirape afilu mimachalas habarus. His wisdom is such he can even heal us from the disease of ignorance. The greatest disease of all. The disease that you think you know it. He can heal us of that. If the moon would come to the Rambam, he would be able to heal even the moon. From its ancient blemish. You know, we know about the moon and the sun. Ancient name, Elohim, Eshtam, Shem, he would be able to heal. He would be able to heal the moon as well. When the Rambam writes his letters, there's a letter in which he describes something about himself. He says this. It's a letter to sages in Lunil in France. There's a nevuah, if you know Yirmiyo, the first chapter of Yirmiyo, Yirmiyo tells God, I'm afraid to become a prophet. So Hashem says, when you were still in the womb of your mother, I chose you. So the Rambam paraphrases that. He says, Before I was formed in the womb, the Torah knew me. Before I left my mother's womb, the Torah has sanctified me. And to spread its wellsprings outwards, God has designated me. This is the love of my life. But with my love, I introduced other women, second women, Gentile women, who became sometimes tzoros. Moyavios, Ammonios, Sidonios, Adumios, Chitios. I introduced Moabites, Chitites. The Ramam, of course, is referring metaphorically to the fact that he searched everywhere. He read everything. Every book of science, every book of astronomy, every book of philosophy, every book of architecture, every book that was available in all the Chachmas of the world, from biology to physics to astronomy to philosophy, every book he put his hands on. <laughs> God knows that they were all taken in order to serve as spices, to spice up and give delicacy to my original love, to my original wife, to show all the nations how beautiful she is. You know, the Ramam is demonstrating his view how for him, Everything ultimately was an exercise in revealing the truth of Hashem, the truth of godliness, the truth of Torah, the truth of Yiddishkeit in the world in the most holistic way, both academically as well as emotionally and as well as practically. So till today, a person wants to understand the exact definition of a sugya. If you want to get to the oimek ha'higoyen, if you want to dissect the definition of a halacha, you look how the Rambam articulates it in Yad HaChazaka, and you'll have there the deepest depths of clarifying any sugi in Gemara and halacha, the way it's crystallized through the words of the Rambam. Till today, great Rosh Hashivas and great teachers and great scholars will sit for months on two lines on a sentence of the Rambam to show his mahalach, how he defined a particular sugi in Bavli, in Yerushalmi, in Zvachim, or in Chulin, in Hilchis Shabbos, or in Hilchis Kelayim, wherever it is, but that same extraordinary depth. That's the Rambam on one level, and that's a very true Rambam. And then there's the Rambam as the great, passionate uh, lover, defender of the Jewish people. There's the Rambam as the great, extraordinary philosopher, and astronomer, and mathematician, and leader. The Rambam passed away in the 
December 13th, 1204. Chav Tevis, Dalad, Tof Tof Kuf Samache. He was born 1135 and passed away 69, 70 years later, 1204, the beginning of 1205. Depends how you make the Cheshbet. Somebody, we don't know who, wrote near his Matseva a line. Adam v'loy Adam. V'im Adam emes mi malachi roim im chaharasa. Oy oimra lekeil be'ein isha ve'ish malach ba'olam tachtain barasa. You got that? I'll explain. A person wrote, I'm not sure, was the Rambam a human being? Was he not a human being? Adam v'loy Adam. If he was really a human being like everybody else, then somehow his mother brought him to the world. He was, came out from the angels of heaven. Or if he's not a person, I tell God, if he didn't come from a woman and from a man, if he didn't have a mother and a father, he certainly looks like a human being. So you basically carved out an angel in the image of a human being down here below. Now, of course, the person wasn't trying to identify myths of another religion, chas v'shalem, but what he was trying to say is that the Rambam as a human being remains an unparalleled source of love and inspiration and wisdom for the eternity of Jewish history. Have a wonderful evening.